Praise the Lord. So I'd like to say good afternoon once again to all of you. And like I said, I'm excited about what God is doing as he's preparing us. And we've been studying the book of 1 Thessalonians. And we're talking about, you know, recognizing the harvest, you know, setting the tone for ministry, uh, but also being aware of the, of the tone that God is setting for the ministry so we can be in line with him. Because we want to make a difference in this lost and dying world. But the general rule you have to understand about social behavior is that we have to earn someone's trust by caring about them first. You know? And I think a lot of times uh, professive believers forget that. See, because people really are not concerned about what you know until they know for certainly how much you care, and especially about them. You know, too often people can't tell the difference between us as professing believers and anyone else. Because oftentimes uh, we're perceived as brash, opinionated, uh, and judgmental in our efforts to be a witness for the Lord. And, and unfortunately that is true the majority of the times. Uh, because we really haven't learned how to really uh, represent who we are. And we become more legalistic. We're more about what you should do or shouldn't do. And, and that's ineffective uh, in service to God. And because of that, whether we like it or not, we all are lumped into a negative stereotype that people have of Christians. And it's because of that, among other things, that we have to learn how to reveal Christ-likeness, how to be Christ-like, which takes time takes personal risk and vulnerability as we are learning, as we are growing in our relationship with God, as we are trying to become who we need to be for each other. And if you can't be what you need to be for each other, how can you be what you need to be for those outside of these walls? And God has put you in a position where you are learning the same things at the same time. You're given the same instructions and you're under the same power as each one that hears these instructions each week, what are we really doing? You know, are we caught up in the world so much that we kind of like do this like everything else, pick it up but never really do anything with it, where it actually changes us, where we actually become what we learn. And, and that's the thing that we have to be aware of as we're seeking to be witnesses for God. And that's why today what we want to talk about is getting in line with God while doing the work of an evangelist. As we look at uh, 1 Thessalonians, Paul is actually reflecting on his first visit there that encouraged him to have faith in what he's doing because he's now seeing that it's been effective. We're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 through 16. And Paul is actually talking about the Thessalonican uh, conversion and coming to Christ. And he says, For this reason we also constantly thank God that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God and Christ Jesus that are in Judea, for you also endure the same sufferings at the hands of your own countrymen, even as they did from the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. They are not pleasing to God, but hostile to all men, hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved with the result that they always fill up the measure of their sins but wrath has come upon them to the utmost. Let the church say amen. amen. As you see, Paul is sharing the time when he came. And he says that when he came, they, he, he is thanking God that they received the word from them for what it was. The word of God. And when we read the word of God, you can have this picture painted in your mind that may not be necessarily true. As it looks like Paul came to Thessalonica, he was received by everybody. There wasn't any, any uh, what's the word, resistance, so he was able to just be successful. Now, isn't that what we're after when we serve the Lord? Now, isn't that what you look for each day when you go out? 
But see, it's not, it's not always like that, right? But this is the thing I want to assure you that you're going to be aware of before you live here today. It's always just like this. It's always just like this. But we need to see it from the proper perspective so that we can see exactly what we're on. Because the objective is we want to position ourselves to recognize what God is doing and telling us. That's very important because in John 5, 19 through 24, as Jesus is our example, he shared with us some very important information about how he was serving the Lord. John 5, 19 through 24. And it reads, Therefore Jesus answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. Whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself is doing. And the Father will show him greater works than these, so that you will marvel. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son also gives life to whom he wishes. You see what Jesus said? He said he doesn't do anything but what he sees God doing and what he hears God tell him. And we know that God has said he does nothing unless he first let his servants know. Now these are things you have to believe. These are things that you have to have assurance of so that when you go out each day, you can be assured that the Lord is with you and that he's leading you like he promised. See, and that's the thing that gives us the confidence in how our life is unfolding, unfolding each day. Because we know that our God can do anything. So if you have anything going on that you think you need, that needs to be taken care of now and is not being taken care of, you need to ask yourself this question. Why not? Why would God allow me to be going through what I'm going through? So that's the objective. Positioning ourselves to recognize what God is doing and telling us. The goal is we want to make sure we bring in the harvest. Because the enemy's number one objective is to prevent you from bringing in the harvest. John 6, 35 through 40. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. And all that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. For I come down from heaven, not only do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in Him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise Him up on the last day. Very important to hear what Jesus said. So if we can understand how to line ourselves up with God and what He's doing as we go out to do evangelistic work. Jesus said, everyone that comes to me, I will not turn away. One of the biggest problems with those professing to be believers and trying to evangelize with God, we don't wait for God to send people to us. We pick where we think we need to go. And it is amazing that everyone talks about evangelism. They want to go to some black poor community. Okay, but where is your art? It's like we're the only people on the planet that need to hear the gospel. And don't you think that's kind of strange? If you go to the average church now, they start talking about doing missionary work, they're going to pick some poor black neighborhood that in their mind, they believe on the Lord. And unfortunately, those are the neighborhoods that call on God the most. Yes. Because <laughs> God has them in a place where they have to stay on their knees. Yep. Dealing with the injustice. Dealing with the inequality. Dealing with their struggle. But no one says, let's go into the rich neighborhood. Let's go into those that look like they have it going on. Those are the people that it's hardest to serve the Lord. Because it's need that turns us to God. But isn't it amazing, don't you think? So that's man trying to figure out who needs the word. 
And that's one thing we have to stop, is looking around, trying to figure out who we think needs the word. And, and that should have come to you clearly as many times as you have received a track from someone. <laughs> or someone coming up to you want to share the gospel with you so you can turn your life over to the Lord. And I'm sure you haven't experienced any of that. Yes, I have. My God doesn't do that. Because God's spirit recognizes himself. And we have to ask ourselves, why do we get caught in these places if we're really being led by the Lord? Sometimes, most of the time, we're not being led. We are going ahead and making Jesus follow, so we think. And these are the things we want to make sure after the day that we no longer put ourselves in these positions and allow the Lord to lead us so we can line up with what we see him doing. These are the strategies that we're going to have to put in place to be able to accomplish this. One is receive the word of God by faith. So when you go back to 1 Thessalonians, he said when they heard the word of God, they received it for what it was. The word of God. See, for you to be able to be effective ministering word, you have to have received the word yourself by faith. Because you have to be an example of what it is you're trying to share with others. The second strategy is learn how to bear fruit and keep it with repentance. If you have truly been born again, that should, your life should be the evidence of that. Not your words, not your crosses, not all your emblems that you use to represent the kingdom of God, but your lifestyle. He says in 13b, you talk about they received the word for what it was as the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. So if you truly have received the word by faith, it is supposed to be performing a work in you. And if you are carrying the word, you should have evidence that that word has been performed a work in you. And if it has, you will not be coming off as brash, Judgmental, arrogant, and self-righteous. Because a lot of times in our witnessing to others, we think uh, sharing our life is the key, which really it isn't. It doesn't really show vulnerability, because what you do in that, you put the person on the spot where they have to change to be like you to be right. Think about your witnesses. Are you putting people in a position where they have to become like you before they can be right? As you're witnessing to them. See, unconditional love doesn't do that. It listens. To get to know who the people really are. See, because when you're really truly evangelizing, you are presenting God to people. And it's in people meeting God that they get to see and experience God's love. God is not talking about people's issues because the sin that is paid. He's talking about how to live the quality of life that he created us to live. And the third thing we need to learn how to what strategy is, is know when to move on. When you see in verse 15 and 16, he says, uh, he's talking about those people, he, how they had suffered from their own countrymen like they had among the Jews. He says, even as they did from the Jews who both killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out, they are not pleasing to God, but hostile to all men, hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. With the result that they always fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them to the most. Understanding that those that stand against God and his will and his business put themselves in God's in, in, in God, under God's wrath. And God will take care of us. But so many times in our efforts to serve the Lord, this becomes the number one tool that the enemy uses to get us distracted. And we're going to see that as we move forward. Which brings to strategy number one. We talk about receive the word of God by faith. Ephesians 1, 13, 14 says, In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise 
of his glory. He says, when you heard the message, when you go out sharing the gospel, when people hear the good news, the evidence that God is working there is they receive it. They receive the message. Those are the ones that you're after. That is the harvest. Those that receive your message. Because faith comes by hearing, not persuasion, not convincing. It comes by hearing because you have to receive the word of God in blind faith. Believing that it is the word of God. That you are, the person that's given it to you is sent from God. And you take it at face value because only then will the understanding of faith in that word be opened up to you or anyone else. And these are the things that you should know because that is what has supposed to have happened to you. Romans 1, 18 through 25. Because we think that we have to do this extra because of where we think men may be or what, how much they've heard the word of God. But God is the one that's at work here. So you need to know where God is with all mankind. Romans 1.18 says, For the wrath of God is, being, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. See, God is working on man the moment he comes into this earth, God starts working on mankind. Making him aware that he exists. Making him aware of what's right and what's wrong. And what God expects of him. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. This before you ever hear a word about Christ. God himself has made sure that every human being understands that he exists. He understands and knows what's accepted about God and what's not. And you see that in little children. Even the things they haven't told you haven't told them are right or wrong. You can see them do things and when you come into their presence, you'll see them trying to hide when they've done something that they know they shouldn't do. They know this. It's instilled in us. And we have been deceived by the enemy to believe that man don't know. Man does know. Instinctively he knows what's of God and what's not. So he says, for even though they knew God. So what God is telling us, if you're born on this planet, you know God. That's why nearly everybody talks about worshiping God. Regardless of what kind of way they worship it, everybody talks about worshiping God in some kind of way, some kind of form or fashion. Why? Because God has made it clear to every human being that he exists. He has put it in the heart of man to know what is right and what is wrong. He knows that. And he's given us legal laws of the land to help remind us when we are not following his way of doing things. That's where the laws came from. It's to remind man when he's not uh, portraying behavior that is conducive to collective, collectively living together with others in a way that's mutually respectful to all. So we have that. And this idea that we have to kind of pet people through and, and do all this massaging for people to get it is a distraction from the enemy. He says... For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations. And their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Man wasn't born a fool, in other words. He becomes a fool based on his speculation and trying to figure things out. In, deny, in, in the denial of what God has already put in his heart of what's right and wrong. You see what I'm saying? You weren't born a fool. You become a fool after you get here. When you start trying to figure things out on your own understanding, that's when you become a fool. And God says, it's at that time 
your foolish heart becomes darker. Your foolish heart has become darker. That's why we work so hard. We must be on with our children to help them avoid becoming a fool and their hearts becoming darkened because of the education they get. They start to think they know more than God. Because it's basics. But it don't make sense to a fool. Who is a fool? A person who trusts in his own understanding. Who trusts in worldly knowledge. See, the world is designed to make you become a fool concerning the things of God. And that's what God says. The things of God are foolishness to the world. Because you've been blinded by the God of this world. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. That's the problem. And this is what we have to make sure we're being delivered from as we seek to go out to serve God. It's not only for ourselves, so we can recognize the fools out there. Because the enemy wants you to get tangled up with fools. Trying to prove to them that God exists. Because when Paul came to the Thessalonica, he ran into a bunch of them. But if you read his, his uh, testimony, it will look like most of the people never followed his word, right? Yes. Not so. And so we want to figure out today from the word how we can avoid the fools and focus on the harvest. And you got plenty of heart. When I think about it, the biggest struggle with serving the Lord is those that you care about that won't receive it. Mm -hmm. And you kind of forget all about those that have received what you had to share, and we don't take the time to build that up, to make it strong. Because we've been told by the enemy we need to chase these fools now, which is not from God. Strategy number two, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Verses 13, B and 14 says, after they receive the word, they start to become imitators of the church of God. See, when you start being effective on the harvest, the harvest starts to imitate you. Starts to practice the things that you've been sharing with them. So that God can allow them to get to know him as you have. And they can have faith in your counsel because it works for them. Matthew 3, 8 through 10 says... Prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Don't just say to each other, we are safe for we are descendants of Abraham, or we confess our life to the Lord. That means nothing, for I tell you, God can create children of Abraham from these very stones. Even now the axe of God's judgment is poised, ready to sever the roots of the trees. Yes, every tree that does not produce good fruit will be chopped down, and thrown into the fire. He said, if you've given your life to the Lord, you're supposed to be living a lifestyle that supports and says that you've given your life to the Lord. Because we're not talking about an image now. Because the image changes with the season. We're talking about identity that never changes. It stays the same because that's who you are. It's Acts 13. Uh, verse 42, as Paul and Barnabas were going out, the people kept begging that these things might be spoken to them the next Sabbath. Now, when the meeting of the synagogue had broken up, many of the Jews and of the God-fearing proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, were urging them to continue in the grace of God. But the next Sabbath, nearly the whole city assembled to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw that the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began contradicting the things spoken by Paul and were blaspheming. Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first, since you repudiate it and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles, for so the Lord has commanded us. I have placed you as a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the end of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as have been appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was being spread through the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of prominence and the leading men of the city and instigated a persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. 
But they shook off the dust of their feet in protest against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were continually filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. You see what he says? To line up with Paul, what God is doing, you have to see what God is doing. And as you see Paul and Barnabas here in Thessalonica, you see that there were those, even of the Jews, that followed Paul. But there also were those that didn't receive the word. But it said that the word kept growing. Why? Because they had came, brought out the harvest, those that loved the Lord. How much time was wasted arguing with those that were trying to kill them? Now you know how to be perfect in your work, right? When you share the gospel, those that receive it, that's the harvest. That's what you focus on. And most of the time, like I said earlier, the world has a strain to focus on those that they get. No. Those that are being saved will receive it. Now, guess what? You did a great job planting some seed. Because that seed fell on some people and it irritated them. But the word, once it goes in your hearing, it's in there. That's right. You got to recognize what God is doing in your environment. When you are sharing the gospel, there's people that's going to receive it. You need to recognize those that are not receiving it, but I've already planted the seed. I can move on now. You get it? You don't have to leave. It may have been 20 people. And only one said, act like they were issued. The angels in heaven are celebrated because of that one. When we've been trained by the world, you got to have numbers. And even though there was one that received what you had to say, we leave kind of dejected because 19 didn't want to hear nothing you had to say. And your mind won't let you focus on nothing but that if you ain't truly set out by God and understanding what your work is. If, if one comes in, God is happy. And if only one came in, God only had one ready. And if God only had one ready and is happy, why shouldn't you be? Amen. Amen. All right. And if none listen, you don't want none of them ready. So move on. All right. Line up with God. Stop trying to make God be somewhere he ain't working. Amen. Amen. Yes. This is how you can line up with God and see what he's doing. And you can hear what he's doing by the response that people give him. Well, I see God having a hard time with that one. Because everybody ain't going to heaven, y'all. There's a synagogue and a church of Satan that has been established. But God says of most miraculous things. Look at Acts 9, 26 through 30. When he came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. But Barnabas told, took hold of him and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had talked to him. And now at Damascus, he had spoken boldly in the name of Jesus. And he was with them, moving about freely in Jerusalem, speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord. And he was talking and arguing with the Hellenistic Jews, but they were attempting to put him to death. But when the brother learned of it, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him away. You got to know when to go. <laughs> See, we've been told you need to stand and fight. Now, this is early in Paul's life. He knew the deal. The people don't want to receive you. Move. Don't leave. But it said the brother had to take Paul out. Paul was ready to fight. And we have to learn when to fold them and recognize when God is at work. God did not send you here to give the word to anybody that don't want it. That's why Jesus said those that came to him. God will send his word to you will send you to his work. You won't know you're going to work because you didn't wake up with your list of people you're going to evangelize to today. You woke up getting ready to go down to the grocery store because you needed some milk. And God show up with some work there for you to do. But if you stuck on getting home and get that meal cooked or whatever you're doing, you're going to miss the work. Because you're supposed to realize when God brings people into your presence, you should know why you're here. I'm not here to get milk. God needed me to come here to get milk because this is where he needed me to work at. So you need to be aware. Don't 
more of that person you see trying to get your eyeball. I ain't got time. They're going to call me to tell. I got to go. Say <laughs> so you ain't done. I know you ain't. I know you haven't done it. I know you haven't. Because <laughs> you've been hurt. You got to get back take care of your business, right? But God has us here as his servants. And this is how we minister for God. But you have to know why you're here. Yeah. And his world is our stage. Daily life is the plan of God. He knows where he wants you and he knows how to get you there. You just have to recognize where you got to go is not a burden. Lord, well, I got a car. I don't want to ride way down there. Lord, have mercy. I should have thought about that. He made you forget it for a reason. He knew that at this point in time, he was going to need to send you there. And because it's his plan, he knows how to move us about and put us where he wants to based on the decisions that we make and the things that we do. That's why you have to be aware and have the prayer, Lord, can I be a blessing where I come into contact with on a daily basis? Just make sure you mean that. Because he will constantly give you opportunities to be a blessing to someone. John 7, 1. After these things, Jesus was walking in Galilee, for he was unwilling to walk in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. You mean to tell me, Jews, Jesus stayed away from a whole city. You know they needed the Lord. He stayed away from a whole city because the Jews were trying to kill him. See, that's all I need right there, y'all. So as I go out ministering the word of God, I do not focus on people that don't want to receive it. I don't respond to them. I don't give them the time of day because I am not here to invest in the enemy's work. I invest in those that God is working on. Because if you have an issue with what somebody said, you already determined war on that. Somebody else probably started that war with you. I'm not going to pick it up. Because obviously you have determined that this is where you stay. I'm good with that. I'm not here for you. That seed seems to be already working on you. And I just watered it. Work goes on. Somebody else may get that harvest somewhere else down the road, but I know that it's not something I need to be focused on trying to bring in a harvest now because you already told me you're green by your response. And because you responded to me, like I just said, that made me realize that I did put some water on that seed that somebody else had planted in you. So I'm going to move on. Now let me focus on the ones that want to receive. And that's how you line up with God as you're doing evangelistic work. Because that was Paul was doing when he came to Thessalonica the first time. He was bringing them the word of God, a place that didn't have. But in bringing the word of God, it was a few that received it. And as they went through their ministry, it helped them recognize where to lay their efforts and where to move on. That's what you have to understand. Now, once you understand that clearly, just look how much work God got you doing. Look how you are influencing so many people in your world. But they were so easy. They take a lot of work. You know, they just came right in. Don't even really feel like you did nothing. So you don't really focus so much on them. You focus on that one in the back of your mind that growls at you every time you say it. You're trying to figure out a better way to present it to them because you want them to get it. Leave those people alone before you find yourself dead. Because if you were left here to work, you need to stay here to work. All right. And if the enemy can't stop you from working, he would like to get you out of here so you can't work no more. That's why you have to learn how to follow God and line up with God so you don't find yourself investing in Satan's work. In closing, there must be a total surrender of your life to God's will to be able to do such a thing. You can't do this if you have not totally surrendered your life to God. This is how you line up with God as you're doing evangelistic work. And as we talked about earlier, it's recognizing the harvest, recognizing where you plant the seed at. You plant the seed in a place or person that hasn't heard the word yet, that's planting the seed. And if the person has heard the word, you water it if they haven't become the crop yet. 
But you understand and recognize everyone that you encounter. And you're able to determine where they are. Because God has taught you how to recognize the harvest, how to recognize how to water, how to recognize how to plant. And so many times we are trying to break in a harvest when there's no crop there. And we find ourselves wasting our time, wasting our energy and our effort, and losing precious time in building up that that God has already given you. And that's been my mission here to challenge us to minister what I've given you, Curtis. Build it up. Seek to help make it better on a daily basis. And as time has passed, I'm seeing a lot of the influence that you all are having among those in your service of influence, just like Paul saw here. He said, I'm hearing about your you and how you're living among people. I'm hearing about you all when I go out. People are giving testimonies about the quality of the life and the lifestyles you're living. People came up to us uh, uh, this week. And uh, this lady, I didn't know what my wife knew. She said, listen, nobody else may have changed. We're talking about church for right? They said, this one may not have changed. That one may have changed. Nobody else has changed. But this guy right here, Pop, I know he changed. <laughs> I know it works. Because he changed. <laughs> so much so, people all over Gaston and Little Rabbits is watching that man back there. <laughs> Because they can see for a fact, hey, that's real he got. That's real he got. And sharing another thing that he shared with me is that this man came to his shop one day and said, look, I want to thank you for praying for me. I was like, how do you know I'm praying for you? He said, you might not be praying for me directly because you don't know my situation. But I know you're praying for everybody in the surrounding areas. How do you know that? <laughs> Pop didn't tell him. God had moved on this man's heart and mind through his observations, realizing that this man is a representative for God in their community. He didn't know. He was shocked. But the fact is, he does pray for everybody in that area. The point I'm making is, God will have you influencing people when you don't even know people know you. When you have had no contact with people, people know that you are set here by God. Why? You have to have totally surrendered your life to God's will. That's one thing I know about him. He has totally surrendered his life to God's will. Because he had the freedom to grow on his own. Yes, when I saw him driving without no driver's license, sitting up in Hardy's like he owned the world, I happened to ride up one day unexpectedly when I went in to eat with him. You think I said anything about who drove you up here? I just sit there and ate me a sandwich quietly and we talked about whatever, but never mentioned this situation. You think he didn't recognize that I recognized he was there driving without driving license? See, we're supposed to be showing the unconditional love of God. Not looking for every chance we get to point out people's shortcomings or not doing what we know they're supposed to do when it's right there in our eyes. Why? Because I know it's God's responsibility through the Holy Spirit to convict and to lead people in righteousness. And if you practice religion, you wouldn't be able to do it. But you'd be like, who drove you up here? <laughs> Knowing that he drove himself. Because I know you ain't sitting here professing to be a Christian and sitting up here breaking the law by driving without no driver's license. See, that's what religious folks do. That's why we are classified as arrogant, you know, judgmental, uncaring, and self-righteous. Because, see, when you approach it like that, you're telling them he has to change to be like you before he can be right. And we got to get away from that, people. That's not what we do. 
Trust me, the love of God will show you all, all of your wrongdoing without anyone mentioning the word. And until we learn how to walk like this, to recognize what God is doing, we're not going to be effective. Why did I say the thing? The man was making a decision to turn his life around. If he's been delivered from drinking and all the other crazy stuff he's doing, I'm sure God can deal with this license situation. You know what I'm saying? And we're not willing to look at the success of others and ourselves so we can have the peace of mind that God is leading us and that we are being used by God. Because we're constantly doing the enemy's bid. Focusing on his work rather than the work of God. I don't know where it finds you, but I hope it finds you excited. And I know it should find you excited because I know you've given your life to the Lord. I know the Lord is using you. My hope is that this message today will make you, put you in a position where you stop wasting on your time on those that have already proven to you that they don't want what you have. And focus your effort and energies on those that God has given you and have them build them up and be a living example for them. Because your life is going to continue to be a testimony even for those that don't want what you have right now. Because they are watching you. Because the more they watch you, the more success they're going to see in your walk and the more struggle they're going to see in their walk if they haven't surrendered their lives to the Lord. We're going to hear some music. Good day to give your life to the Lord. A good day to get things straight with the Lord. Good day to become a member of this body of Christ that we have to come on. This is a music brother, but our people ponder on this situation and decision.